Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Knud Oxnevad. I'm the president of the Norway California Business Association and CBA. And I'd like to welcome everybody here today. And before we start, I'd like all of you to go to this little chat bubble we have and type in where you're coming from. Um, we sometimes have people covering the planet from east to west. It's very exciting. And for those who are signing up, please please at this point. That would be good. So, um, so that was the first one. Let me say a few words about NCBA, uh, Norway California Business Association. And, um, and um, okay, can can everybody meet them? Okay, all right. Um, so Norway California Business Association is an organization promoting collaboration between organizations in the U.S. Uh, primarily in California, and we've been focusing on JPL and NASA and the organizations in Norway. We also collaborate and encourage collaboration between uh, Norwegian organizations in the U.S. and especially California. We like to look for areas that are naturally, um, what should I say, common to the for both Norway and California, such as ocean, sustainability, if you go to ocean, you can also think about Norway being in the north. So ice and cold is also a very natural area for our focus. We have Svalbard, fantastic testing. And if you now think about ocean walls, what is that? That is ice, it is ocean, and it's also high pressure. And Norway is rather famous for its oil and gas installations in the North Sea. And uh, we uh, have there for a lot of commonalities i'm trying to sort of mute people as we go here mute here we go okay um in that area so um again can i ask people to mute themselves at this point um we'll get back to that later um so we, we're developing very exciting collaborations we see already organizations in norway and the jpl um starting to develop strong bonds and connections and uh, so that's very exciting. Now, I asked everybody if they could to put in a little bit of information about where they're coming from in the chat bubbles. I'm gonna look at that now and see where people are coming from. I have uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, welcome. Ray NASA, okay, Chicago. I got Denver, I got California. Um, I got even more up here. Let's see, I got... Um, Chicago again, Virginia, uh, Norway, that'd be Marcus. Welcome, Marcus. I know it's very early for you. San Diego, uh, UK, uh, early for you too. Thank you, uh, welcome. And we got, again, UK, and we got New Jersey, and I think that I covered everything. San Pedro, I think, was at the bottom there as well. So welcome, everybody. Um, the, the way we tend to do this in, in, on a practical level uh, first, um, Dr. Jean-Pierre Floreal, who's our speaker, I will introduce to you to him in talking. Um, he will talk. Uh, again, please mute yourself. That will be very helpful to everybody else. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, so uh, he, he will give a talk. It's going to be about 20 minutes, and uh, then there will be time for questions. During this talk, we encourage you to use the chat bubble and ask questions, or rather write in questions, and we will give you a chance to ask that question yourself after the, um, the talk, and um, then you um, can have good interaction. That's the whole idea here. And we also encourage you to, if you have video, to then uh, turn on your video, uh, be part of the conversation. So that is the practical part of this. Now, let me start by talking before I do that. Okay, again, can I encourage everybody to uh, mute themselves? That will be very helpful. I see, there we go. Anybody else? That'll be good. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, so, today's talk 
is descending through more than 25 kilometers of ice in search for life on Jupiter's moon Europa. And uh, since you are part of this, you are joining the journey, and uh, we really encourage to have you being part of this journey. Um, I'm going to say a few words about Jean-Pierre Florial. It's Dr. Jean-Pierre Florial. He's a senior research scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory with more than 30 years of experience in solid state energy conversion R&D. He holds a PhD in material science from the National Polytechnique Institute of Laurent, France, and a professional engineering degree from the School of Mines, also in France. He has achieved international recognition in his field as a leader in the R&D of novel materials and devices for thermoelectric energy conversion. Um, he is currently a member of the Power and Sensor System section, and he serves as Chief Technologist for JPL's Nuclear Systems Program. He is now Principal Technologist for the Next Generation Radioisotope Thermoelectric Generator Project, and he recently served as a principal investigator for an ice penetrating cryobot concept development that would enable the scientific exploration of our solar system ocean worlds. I've had the pleasure of working for Jean Pierre on a number of what these projects mentioned. And I've also had the pleasure of working on cryobots all the way since uh, 2001, where I helped do testing at Sval on Svalbard of the cryobot we had then. So um, it's with great pleasure I'm able to introduce uh, Jean-Pierre, and I will first make him a presenter, and then I'll uh, give the floor to him. Let's see. Uh, we go here, and we're going to go there and make presenter. And Jean-Pierre, you can turn on your uh, presentation. Okay. Very good. Let me do that. Thank you, Knut, for the nice presentation. Um, let me start, and hopefully everybody see the full <coughs> screen presentation. Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the nice forward. I, I realize there's a lot of people from different time zones, so um, sorry for those who are in the middle of the night um, in Europe. Um, it's just getting dark right here in, in California. So um, I'm going to talk to you for about uh, a series of studies we've done over the last couple of years, um, tried about understanding how to um, develop a mission concept that would allow uh, going deep in the ice of ocean worlds, of which uh, last time in counting, I think we had something like 15 in our solar systems. Um, and especially the ones who uh, harbor a, a, a big ocean, um, and such as Europa or Enceladus uh, in particular, and understanding how we actually do that. Um, the, um, <clears throat> we had a big study team, so there's a long list of people. Uh, Knut is, is in there, actually. Um, and uh, there was a, for JPL. So we had a basically a very multidisciplinary team uh, you know, science, uh, planetary science, um, technologists, um, uh, engineers, um, and uh, uh, people from, mostly from JPL. We had a couple of people from the Department of Energy, uh, because as you, you'll see that um, the implementation of such a concept requires um, the utilization of a nuclear space power system. So, and you're in there. So, let me talk first about the introduction. I think you there was a talk earlier that you mentioned from Sam Howell, who was a, our principal scientist for for the project. Um, and so it is now uh, uh, well understood that there are very strong drivers um, for exploring ocean worlds, um, and people understand that the search for extant life uh, is best answered by in situ exploration of those uh, bodies. Uh, which means going through the ice shell interior and try to access the ocean of those ocean wells. Um, and so there's different uh, um, 
the documents, they're part of the science community at large in the US and, 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 and worldwide. They talk about, uh, you know, particular link to uh, planetary, outer planets exploration, the search for life in the universe and astrobiology. And there have been several groups now that's forming for ocean world exploration. If there's a network for ocean worlds, for example, that exists certainly in the US um, for, for, for looking at that. So the idea is really to, um, uh, we want to enable, to understand how to enable uh, scientific exploration to descend below uh, the ice, beneath the ice of ocean worlds to characterize the subsurface as we're going down and eventually search and search for life. Um, <clears throat> so one way to, uh, since you heard the science being presented, now talking about how we actually do that. So one aspect of this is understanding our, we'll call it uh, the constraint of uh, doing mission design. Um, so here's an example here on the left um, for on the left image to, to demonstrate how long it takes to, for example, go to one of the moon of uh, Jupiter. Um, that it takes five, seven years to fly there. Um, then another couple of years to come down to orbit to get close to the, to the moon. Then you land. So if you think about landing, you're seven to nine years after launch of land, from landing on the surface. And then the goal is to uh, go through the ice, the picture on the right, um, for you know it just a few years so that the total mission length we're looking at is on the order of 15 years which is you know we've done mission longer than that but 15 years is uh, typically within the range of, um, of uh, you know life uh, design life for many of the technologies including um, the nuclear power system that would support this so we call that last phase uh, ice entry descent and ocean access edo um, and uh, uh, for short um, and this is going through the thick ice shell of those of those bodies. So <clears throat> accessing the ocean, going all the way to the ocean, requires some missing pieces. Um, well, one is obviously understanding how to operate a mission that's never been done before through a thick ice shell and being able to actually uh, get through it, um, understanding all the re all what's going to be required, all the hazards we may have to avoid. Um, and all the, uh, you know, the challenge in terms of um, acquiring the scientific data, sending the data back, um, and uh, having autonomy, uh, autonomous operation of this uh, during the phase. And that requires a new science-driven, you know, mobility platform with a lot of built-in autonomy because you're too far for doing, uh, we'll say, uh, telecontrol from Earth. And uh, we call that the cryobot. Our project was called Prime. It stood for probe using radioisotope for uh, a system for uh, icy moon exploration. Um, <clears throat> so when we think about what it takes to do this uh, uh, concept, the, the operating the phase, operating, concept of operation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, hopefully uh, it went away. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so the uh, one mission we're looking at, like you know, the, the, oh. let me try again. Um, so we have those phases of going from the ice entry on the left, uh, going through the descent, descent in the cold, brittle ice, which is very conductive, going to the cold uh, to a warmer ice transition descending to that ice which is near closest to melting temperature and finally accessing the ocean in a and and being able to know when we get there so those steps uh are can be the first step because it's in a cryogenic environment a vacuum in cryogenic environment um it's hard to replicate this on earth so the best way to do it is actually demonstrating some in some kind of a laboratory test bed for the first steps the uh, the final steps can actually be demonstrated in the field, you know, under warm ice, quote unquote, conditions like on Earth, and you can simulate things like pressure. Uh, you can understand, uh, you know, having sampling strategies, as well as understanding when you break through and get to the ice ocean interface, how you might anchor yourself. Um, and the idea is to demonstrate that you could achieve this uh, travel through the ice, through the ocean. In so-called a, pro a programmatically acceptable time, which means that, you know, 
where risk uh, uh, is 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 acceptable of the probe actually making it there and having a return a science return on a reasonable time scale so just a few years in other words so how do we understand how to what the cryobot uh, needs to be uh, designed um, so <clears throat> well first off is to understand what's been done before so one one thing to to look at is what was done before you know in the 1960s looking at melt probes on in terrestrial environment uh, going to one kilometer deep there have been some models uh, uh, developed um, in the 90s, uh, actually, there was a lot of resurgence in petri mal probes. Actually, I've been at JPL for a long time, and we used to have a Europa-based uh, mission concept for a long time. So the latest is, is Europa Clipper, which is due for launch in 2024 or 2025 now. Um, and uh, But we've had mission concept for going after those interesting um, uh, icy moons, you know, ever since the Voyager probes. Um, so uh, in the, about 20 years ago, there was a first uh, more detailed concept that would actually utilize radioisotope power systems. So using the decay heat of um, a radioisotope fuel to uh, produce, uh, to use that as uh, heat to melt the ice and then heat as well to produce electricity for powering the probe. Um, and um, those first element of flight system would demonstrate to about 20 meter depth in early 2000 in Svalbard, uh, of all places, by one of the JPL teams uh, at the time, Wayne, Wayne Zimmerman was leading that effort. Um, through the 2000s of continuous interest in looking at uh, what happens, uh, but it's been, it was touch and go. Uh, <clears throat> as technology has been evolving, there's been more and more interest into this. So NASA has developed some uh, uh, different programs aimed at uh, uh, spacecraft technologies or probe technologies or instruments for cold and cryogenic uh, moon environments. Um, there was a study that was conducted in 2017 to uh, look at uh, the problem in a little more detail. There were some recommendations coming from that study. And then we started this uh, 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 as part of the investment in NASA technologies, we conducted this study that I'm going to give you some results about. So one way to put things in perspective of the ch in terms of the challenge is when we look at what's been done over the years in terms of terrestrial type technologies for, um, you know, on Earth, you know, we, we find out that, uh, you know, in the last uh, 40 years, those technologies have been approaching, you know, the kilometer type depth. Um, and, uh, you know, without, I would say, spectacular breakthrough progress in terms of depth, uh, certainly in terms of capabilities. Uh, when we look at systems that look more like integrated um, flight-like systems, um, it's much more difficult, uh, and so much shallower depths have been achieved to date. What is really needed is to go and demonstrate multi-kilometer uh, um, depth penetration uh, of ice using uh, autonomous capable science, uh, you know, a t a platform that actually have some science capability on board. Uh, so, okay, that's a challenge, you know, uh, we're shooting for things that could be tens of kilometers deep, anywhere from 15 to 40 kilometers deep. So how do we do that? So one way to think about it is, uh, you know, we're talking about ocean access. Uh, what is our challenge? So one way is to frame the problem is to think about uh, what are the science targets that the community has um, identified. Uh, Europa being the most challenging one. Uh, one of the reasons is in terms of the uh, size of the moon, the thickness of the ice shell, and the radiation on the surface. Um, we understand how long it takes to go to Europa, what launch vehicles are available to us. Uh, once we know that, we understand how much we may land on such an airless, you know, planetary uh, moon. Um, and once we know the mass, we understand, <laughs> provide some frame on to what kind of cryobot technology we might be able to put on the surface. Um, the sizing makes us understand what kind of heat source requirement we may have in terms of how much uh, power density we need. And then that density combined with the sizing allows us to understand how long it takes to get to the ocean. So we have a way of bounding this and so we did this work to try to understand uh, that we wanted to land something that would be less than a few hundred kilograms, and just because that's what we think we can land in the near term. 
um, and the, the, to focus on radioisotope heat source for the uh, providing the heat to do this and shooting for a few years for the reaching the ocean. So this is informed by uh, the environment. So we're looking at the environment, uh, in this case of Europa, there have been some uh, major results coming up uh, recently in terms of understanding how much ice there is, how thick it may be. So for example, the, the um, plot on the right, giving you con uh, the combined thickness. On the left axis, uh, you see the convective warm ice thickness. On the right axis, you have the brittle cold ice thickness. And so people have done, based on the results to date and observation from probes, um, the, you know, using kind of a um, Monte Carlo type analysis, trying to understand what are the, uh, what the environment is probably going to look like. And that helps us understand the problem at hand. Um, so when we think about uh, the cryobot and look at the design drivers, which I was just talking about, the next step is just to understand how we might decompose its function, what function needs to be on board this, uh, uh, this particular cryobot. So I'm going to come back to that, but we can basically break it down in, um, I would say, uh, four, uh, five different uh, sections. One is uh, the fact that we need to be able to do science. So there's a science payload on board the probe. Uh, we need to do mobility to be able to go through the ice. Uh, that mobility needs to be uh, uh, supported by a heat, a thermal and an electrical power system. And then we need to be able to send the data back to, uh, to the surface and back to Earth eventually. So I need some communication. So these are the main things. And then I finally, I need a margin, volume margin to account for, you know, either a bigger science need or, you know, technology uh, challenges in developing this. So the next step is to understand um, how I might be doing this, this particular sizing. So uh, if I look at the functional decomposition, I can look at the three basic uh, key technology, core technologies. One is mobility that enables safely to, uh, you know, in a safe way to descend through the ice shell at a good clip. So I can do this and we define, you know, six essential function out of this. Um, what we call a heat power and water system that is used to efficiently go through the ice um, and support the mobility system, um, which is, uh, you know, the, the traveling. So there are six essential, again, uh, functionalities that we have here identified. And then a communication system uh, which to be able to make sure that we can actually um, send the data back to the science folks on Earth. And there are five key functionalities in there. Um, <clears throat> so we define those uh, functionalities, uh, group them back into modules, understood their interdependencies to be able to actually uh, have a flight system design that actually closes. So uh, this chart, I'm not going to run through this detailed chart, but, uh, you know, kind of uh, give you in a nutshell uh, how we do this. We define first the kind of the volume requirements for the three primary components, the payload here in green for science, engineering subsystem, which have to do with everything to drive the, the probe through um, and all the controls. And then the power system module, which is uh, providing a lot of heat and a significant amount of electricity. Um, it happens that the power system modules in many ways controls the sizing of the cryobot, in particular its diameter. And the diameter controls uh, has a direct impact on how long it takes to get to the ocean. It, we, in a way, it controls the speed of the probe. So once we have this idea of the sizing and our know, interdependencies and we add margins to this uh, appropriately and we combine this with the environment, we can actually have an idea of how long it takes for a given design to go to ocean. So this next slide kind of illustrate this a little bit. So one is here showing a plot that's showing of looking at the power source thermal density, the heat density, how many heat per cubic centimeter is being used, combined with the science payload, gives me an idea of how much, how many kilowatt of heat I need to have in there. Um, and how, how much science I'm able to bring along depending on the sizing relationships. So we can pick a design point here. Um, we combine it with the environment model. We can define four here typical environments. 
Um, Sesame means it's a, it's one of the recent call that was looking for a 15 kilometer ice shell on, on Europa. And then we gave three probabilistic um, environment. Uh, one has a lot of warm ice, one has a lot of cold ice, and one is somewhere kind of re kind of a, uh, in the middle of our probability distribution function. So that's why we end up with 25 kilometers, 16 kilometers of cold ice, nine kilometers of warm ice. And uh, we can look at how long it takes, depending on how much margin we apply to the model to get to meet those different things. So the bottom line is uh, we can, we find out that with the design, the way we're closing the design, that we could meet 80% of cases uh, that were um, representative from our in understanding of the environment on Europa. And we understand we can complete this in, you know, anywhere from two to six years, which is well within what is uh, programmably acceptable. And so it means that we could certainly complete the mission within the design life of one of the critical technology, which is the radio isotope thermoelectric generator to, that actually would power the system. So if I group all this back into the, the exercise, you can see that in the end, what we ended up with the study is we had something that was roughly four meter long, 23 centimeter in diameter, uh, had a significant uh, science allocation uh, in terms of uh, volume, which would, um, we had done a separate studies on what science instrument, typical science instrument that would have to go in there. And we were well under the 350 kilogram uh, mass margin mass target that we had. So uh, we were in good shape on this thing. So we ended up with a flight system design, which is this one that, that actually closes in terms of the uh, mission concept architecture. Um, and we can identify what are the tall poles that we need to work on. So when we look at the path forward, you know, we did the, the study in three steps. We have completed the first two steps. So the first step was understand uh, mission design, you know, holistic mission architecture, mission feasibility, key traits and constraints, you know, like, how much mass can I land on the surface and when? Uh, the next step was understanding all the requirement for uh, doing the entry, descent, and ocean access operation, operating phase of the mission, understanding all the interdependencies, all the function needed to be on board. We flagged the technology gaps. And then while we identified those three uh, technologies, mobility, the heat power and water module, and the communication system are three of the long lead critical technology they need to be, people need to work on uh, if we want to make this a reality uh, for uh, a future space mission. What we were targeting was a, a potential mission that could launch in the mid 2030, would basically potentially access the ocean roughly about 12 years later. So you launch in 2035, you might breach the ice ocean interface in 2047. So some of us will be retired, but uh, it's, it's very exciting because all the way down uh, from the surface down, we would be looking for um, extant life and uh, doing a very one in a kind, uh, you know, one of a kind uh, mission concept that nobody has ever done before. So uh, that's where we are today. And um, uh, we're pretty excited of uh, pursuing those technology, uh, this technology development. And that's the conclusion of my talk. So, uh, you know, this is a JPL, NASA JPL Caltech mantra, their mighty things. It was written on our parachute from uh, Mars 2020, but uh, it's very true here again. Thank you very much. Knut, do you want me to show that? Um... Yeah, let's see, what do we have here? Um, we have... Uh... Yeah, why don't you show, but yeah, do, do as we talked about, maybe fast forward to the key elements and then we can take questions. So uh, Very good. So, yeah. so can you can you see my screen? Uh, Will in a second, I'm sure. Um, I see your screen, but I don't see the video yet. Here we go. There we go. Perfect. All right. So let me show you this video. I, I walked through the first three minutes. There's no uh, stirring music, but um, here's Europa in front of Jupiter. So we take a close up of Europa. We're going to take a nice cut through the through the moon. Um, Europa is about the size of our own moon. Uh, so here it is, it's about 100 kilometer deep ocean, uh, and then, uh, you know, 25 kilometer thick ice shell. Uh, I mean, here it's a little thinner. 
Um, and looking at the surface, you know, there's a pretty intense radiation field on the surface of Europa. I mean, people say that, you know, if you had a human on the surface, you would not survive for more than 18 minutes because of the radiation from coming from Jupiter. Um, so that's one of the challenges. So here is a probe sitting on the surface. Uh, here is a, an illustration of the, uh, the probe. So you would make contact with the surface. As you do this, the heat starts sublimating the ice. As you close this cavity, it would turn into an actual, uh, you start, pressure will start building up. Here is the probe. We think that you need some mechanical drilling to get started because the, the ice is like basically a rock at the beginning. Um, and as you go through, you start going to melt mode. So now we're poking through the top surface of the ice. Going through, we need to try to detect uh, uh, one. So this is leaving some module. This is the module we'll be sending data for. It's, it's connected to the lander and it's shielded from radiation. Uh, as we keep going through, we would be leaving basically little, uh, in one of those con concepts, leaving little uh, pucks for relay, uh, relaying communication to the surface as we are boring through the ice. Uh, at the same time, we need to detect, uh, you know, forward, we have a sonar or some other mechanism to be able to detect. Uh, here is an illustration, an embedded meteorite from, you know, eons ago that got stuck in the ice. Uh, so we can maneuver, so steering and maneuvering uh, is important, having to do this all autonomously. As we keep going, uh, we would eventually reach the ice ocean interface. And here we go, we're going to break through, the, uh, uh, through that interface. We have to detect the interface and safely anchor ourselves to, um, uh, to that so we don't keep dropping and get crushed by pressure. Uh, so here's in this particular imp uh, illustration, we have, uh, it actually has a, a forward uh, compartment in which we are releasing uh, an ocean going payload. So in this particular case, I think it's one of the talk you, you guys saw, which was called uh, Brewy, a little robot, but you know, it can be anything. It could have no payload or a payload. The idea would be to look at the ice ocean interface where you might have a lot of science, uh, interesting science targets. And I will stop it there. And I guess uh, go to Knut for questions. Me, that's always a good thing to start with. Well, thank you again, Jean-Pierre. This was really awesome. And I've seen developments since I sort of uh, got less involved here lately. Um, but um, I don't see a whole lot of questions. So I guess you're holding off on your questions. But if you have, uh, let's see. OK, I got first one, Kelly. Uh, do you want to ask your question? And if you want to turn on your video, please feel free to do that and unmute yourself. Not tonight. Okay. But you want, okay. The, the question is, how does the probe steer through ice and ocean? I think I'm going to have to take the question. <laughs> <laughs> how does it steer? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, actually, um, I don't know if people can still see my screen or not, but <clears throat> let me show you uh, the probe here. Um, if you can see the probe on my screen, you see that uh, it's, it's called pendulum steering. Um, so the way it's done is, uh, so the probe has an even diameter. So this is for uh, the ability to do um, mechanical drilling or some, some kind of mechanical drilling. So we have those heated, heated fins at the back in, our, in this particular concept. And what they, they do, they allow us to, by doing differential heating, they allow us to basically orient the probe. I mean, th those moons have weak gravity. So it's always one of the challenge to make sure that you're going vertical <laughs> toward the center is not sideways. Uh, and then you can do with this differential heating at this level in this ring, you can actually start slowly uh, moving the probe in one direction or another. So uh, the need to do hazard avoidance, um, you need to understand how far ahead you can detect, uh, for example, obstacles. You need to go th either through or around. And what are your ability to, one of the technology challenges to demonstrate how much steering you can really do 
how long it takes. So for example, I may have to detect things as far as say a kilometer or to be, if it's a big obstacle, if I need to go and move to the, say to the right by say um, 20 meters or something. So the probe doesn't go that fast. In the movie, it had to go fast, otherwise we would be watching this for three years. Um, but in reality, it, it goes anywhere from 30 centimeters an hour at the beginning, at the best case, to maybe a couple of meters an hour uh, toward the end. So uh, it's not fast. Um, and so there is time to maneuver. It's just that you have a, the steering angle is not, you know, it's, it's small. It's like moving a, an ocean liner. Yep. Okay, great, thank you. And I got a question from Karen Patel. Uh, do you want to turn on your uh, microphone and show your video and ask the question? Yeah, sure. So Jean-Pierre, thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. So my question is, um, if the probe is going through the ice, what happens if it hits a rocky surface instead of a liquid water interface, as, as you said? So what would happen? What would be the mitigation scenario for the, your rogue guy here? Right. So uh, if, you, if you can still see my screen, um, let me, let me blow, blow this one up. So <clears throat> this is what we were just talking about before. You, you can see that uh, to be able to descend to the shell, ice shell, so one is uh, having to go through the ice. For, so for example, here, there's a make, uh, in this little drawing here, if you can see the, my mouse pointer, um, there is a drilling, mechanical drilling, to go through, say, a sediment layer that we have determined we can actually go through. Um, and the way we are doing this, you know, a common problem in those ice probe is actually sediment building up in the front and basically stalling the probe. So we have a, it's a hybrid system. So you have mechanical drilling, you have passive melting, just the heat being uh, transferred to the to the front, and then you also have water jetting. And water jetting has been proved to be uh, an efficient way of actually um, moving the uh, debris around the probe and behind it as you keep going through. For things that we cannot go through, like a rock, like here, you have to steer around it. So you need to be able to detect it um, and be able to figure out uh, far enough that you can actually, you know that you can actually move around it. Uh, the probe is also fairly tall. So if there are cracks in the ice or cavities, you know, for, it's four meter long and so um, it, it People in Europe, I don't think they're actually uh, features, um, they are much, you know, any bigger than, than maybe a meter or something in there. There's, of course, science evolves and uh, people firstly, uh, you know, argue about, you know, underground lakes versus, uh, or underground cavities, caves versus, uh, uh, versus not. But uh, most of the challenge are in that brittle ice layer I was talking about. So, okay. does that answer your question, Curran? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, moving on. Uh, Ed, a question from you. Do you want to take it yourself and turn on the video or at least unmute yourself? Ed? I saw a question from Ed, uh, uh, Knut. It has to do with the cavities. No, um, yeah, it does. Yeah. Well, actually, it's communication. Ed is the communication. Ah. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's further off. But I thought maybe he was here, but maybe he's not. Okay, the, I, I think I'll just step in the ad then for a second. Uh, please explain a little more how communication will be done from probe over 25 kilometers to probe on surface. Seems difficult. <laughs> yes, so um, <laughs> uh, let, let me, uh, yeah. So, so there are different ways, let, let me go. I mean, I have the, in this presentation, I have more or less this drawing. So <clears throat> here's one implementation. So where we ended up with was a, a hybrid uh, system of a tether, a very thin tether. So we need a tether anyway for uh, two pieces for sure. One is a tether from, uh, in Europe, you need to have, basically you need to bury under the surface what I call the lander module, the lander electronics because uh, radiation is so harsh on the surface that short of an actuator and antenna, 
you need to keep all your electronics buried under. So we basically entrain that first uh, package. And so it's, it's basically hardwired to the lender. So that's, that's the answer there. Then at the bottom, uh, we need to anchor ourselves. So we use the last communication relay to anchor ourselves safely uh, far ahead of the uh, ice ocean interface. We don't want to keep falling through because, you know, 100 kilometers of ocean will be just uh, squashed way before we get to the bottom uh, on Europa, not through an Enceladus. But so there is a, also their uh, reinforced um, uh, tether in between. Uh, we have reduced a number of relays. So they are powered relay, uh, which also have a small radioisotope thermotic generator in it. Um, and they basically send to a, they are dual RF acoustic sensors. Uh, RF is great in cold ice and acoustic is great in warm ice. And so they have this dual capability and we have one uh, and they are redundant. So we, we have them, we have enough of them that we can cover up to 40 plus kilometer of ice between the lender package and the probe uh, anchor. Um, so, and we have done studies so far. So one of the big technology demo we were planning on doing is actually to go, uh, I, I think at Svalbard and um, yes. demonstrate uh, 10 plus kilometer of, um, of, this, of uh, communication uh, in ice with burying those sensors in ice and demonstrate that. And then we could go across, because you have to worry about attenuation through, for example, feature in the ice, such as cracks or sediments or th that might um, dampen the, the signal, which is why we have this, uh, a tether that goes all, all along. So even if the tether is, is uh, sheared, we will still be able to communicate. But uh, yeah, you have to do a redundant system. Otherwise, um, there's nothing worse than losing communication. It kind of kills the mission, basically. Yes. Yep. <laughs> OK, I, I think Ed was happy with that. Uh, no protest. OK. Thank you, Ed. Um, Boris, do you want to ask your question? Oh, OK. <clears throat> yes, I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, you too. Oh, good, good. Yeah, well, basically, uh, I was wondering if you have things like ice quakes that could uh, break the connection of the unit uh, with with the surface. Uh, is that a, a danger, like movement of the ice? Yeah, so... Uh, Here, before you do that, let me just introduce Boris. He is one of the gurus of 3D printing going back 30 years, um, just so you know. All right, the yeah. big three print me a cryobot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, actually, uh, uh, joking aside, uh, we had three D printing as part of the cryobot technologies, and uh, I didn't show it in this presentation, but um, um, there is a pretty complex um, two phase heat exchanger that's built in in the front, and um, that's embedded into a pressure vessel, um, and that. One of the technology that's most uh, we're looking at was actually 3D, uh, manuf 3D printing and 3D manufacturing. Um, that's the only way to make such a complex shape. So we have some some interest there. Um, you were asking me what was the question now? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, um, the kind of ice quakes or um, oh yes 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 within the uh, the ice sheet that could break the connection to the surface. Yeah, so one of the, uh, yes, yeah, so, so they're definitely shearing of the ice. Uh, so we under, we, th there is some understanding of how much um, ice flexing there is. So one of the reasons that Europa, especially true of Enceladus in particular, but because you have the tides of being next to one of those ice, you know, one of those uh, uh, giant planets uh, like Jupiter, uh, just uh, you have some, some f uh, flexion of the ice shell. Um, and so, uh, there's ongoing work, not done by us, but done by um, the Applied Physics Lab, um, John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, that is looking at how much shearing, how much, uh, you know, um, how to design a tether that could take the kind of 
sharing loads that we can think of, uh, we can think about. So, which is why we have this hybrid system where the, the, the top surface and the top end are not subject to this. It's a reinforced tether. The one that could break is the one in the middle, um, but it, it's supplemented by those uh, pucks that uh, are pretty insensitive to those type of uh, seismic movements. Um, and uh, so this is how we are dealing with it. So. Okay, good. Boris, you good with that? Uh, yes, thank you. Also, um, what about is most of this uh, going down with the, the with the heating probe? Is that uh, using gravity primarily? Yes. Yeah. Ab ab yes, absolutely. Yeah, the probe is using gravity, um, and so um, w there's a little bit more gravity, uh, obviously, on um, Europa than um, I think it's. Point point yeah. two something on on Europa and point oh two on on Enceladus. Yeah, so so Enceladus is very small, very small, uh, which is why the pendulum steering is one of the methods that's used to ensure that you can actually uh, use a little bit of gravity that assists that you have to ensure that you're traveling in a vertical way. But on Enceladus, we think the ice is much thinner. Um, oh, and okay. so um, you could um, potentially get there, uh, you know. It happens that when we did the Enceladus and Europa studies, it, with our design, it takes about as long to go through the Enceladus uh, ice shell than it goes through the uh, Europa. Um, the difference being that on Enceladus, um, because of the low gravity, you could actually fall to the bottom of the ocean and not be crushed with a kind of a pressure vessel designed for Europa. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, that's that's how we we do that. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh -huh. Great. Great to have you on, Boris. He's an old friend of mine, so very great to have you on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and, and then going back to Ed, um, Ed, are you there? Or if not, I'm going to ask the question again. Will there be voids of liquid water on the way that would mess the probe up? Yeah, so what I was just saying, there have been some uh, furious debate about uh, uh, the under, underground feature that might be in the ice. Um, right now, I would say the consensus is that the features of any cavity, uh, filled or not, uh, is, is you know, small enough that a four meter long probe would not care. Okay. Um, and, uh, but it is one of the potential uh, uh, concern. And so, uh, which is why hazard detection is a critical feature of the cryobot ability in terms of both uh, determined, uh, you know, flagging uh, basically cavities as uh, solid objects that we may have to be going around. Right. Um, and most of those features are expected to be found in the brittle layer uh, of ice on the, you know, uh, the warm ice is the convective ice that's seen, well, in geological times, uh, more frequent, um, you know, uh, renewal. Uh, so, but yeah, so for Europa, um, Sam would tell you that, uh, Sam Howell, the principal scientist, would tell you that we don't expect large cavities for which a pope would just fall and like sideways. Okay. So. All right. I think but, but the main thing is not to, is to avoid them in the first place. Yeah. Okay. Um, James McEwitt, uh, did you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, if that's okay. Can you hear me all right? By all means. Glad to have you with us. Excellent. Thanks for a great presentation. And I'm, I'm hoping that animation you showed is online somewhere or somewhere I can access it because that was fantastic. Um, I was hoping to ask to what detail you designed uh, kind of the drill, whether you'd performed any uh, modeling of the, the surface uh, for numerical simulations, whether you you figured out uh, exactly if you did those interaction simulations with the drill and the surface. Yeah, so there's a uh, there's a number of um, uh, there's a program called Sesame that the NASA is funding uh, that's still still in the second year. There are several organizations working on on this. For example, I will uh, give names like uh, uh, Stone Aerospace or uh, honeybee robotics um, in particular that are looking at uh, um, mechanical drilling 
or uh, both. Uh, uh, one of the things we have here, we have heat. So heated drilling is also one of the things to look at. But cryogenic ice, yeah, behaves like, you know, the surface of Europa or Enceladus, we're talking 90K or 100K. So it's really cold, really hard. And, um, and so there are ongoing um, technology development to demonstrate um, efficient drilling. Um, and there, there are some uh, demonstration already. Um, how much power it takes to do this. Uh, that is most likely, you know, communications and the mechanical drilling would be the biggest um, electrical re uh, power requirement on the probe. Um, and um, we're looking at different different options. But yes, it's uh, when you're actually on the surface, you are in vacuum. So you're only doing, there's only sublimation going on, if, if at all. So you really have to rely on um, mechanical drilling and the people are looking at different blade designs. So I think you, you, if you look for it, you, you can find some, some of those reports, uh, especially if you go at proceedings of like, for example, the uh, AGU conference um, or um, uh, yeah, AGU would be a good place to be. Uh, but if you're interested, just send me an email. I can point you to some of those people doing those studies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, Thanks uh, very much. Yeah, I think there is an email here, so we just send the question there, and we'll um, hook you up with Jean Pierre. Not a problem. Yep. Okay. Yeah, but it's a big challenge. Yes, it is a significant challenge, and this is what we believe. We also don't expect the drill to work for three years or four years, right? So um, that's one thing we learn in space. Anything is a dynamic and moving parts. Don't expect it to last too long. So, <laughs> so it's really for the ice entry that we consider that we need the drill or maybe in very, uh, we would stop it and then most likely we, we may have to use it further down, for example, to go through a sediment layer or something like this, but we don't intend to use it for a very long time. Okay, brilliant, okay. thank you. Great, thank you, James. Um, Ed, I think you had a question here, also had a question about voids. I think we, uh, we went through that, so I think we should be good on that. And um, I think we can, you also, the next one here, it's not a dumb question, no questions are dumb. Um, you're saying, so the probe uses heat to melt its way deeper, but what melts it downward for such a long time? I think we agreed that was gravity. Um, would you agree with that, Jean-Pierre? So we can... Yes, right, right. And, and, and the heat is provided by the um, radiostop power system, right? We, we have roughly, our design had something north of 10 kilowatt of heat. Yeah. Um, and uh, that combined with the narrow diameter, that's what allowed us to, to go through it. I mean, in a warm ice, you, you just need the passive melting. That's, that's the only thing you need. So most of the other, like um, water jetting or the uh, uh, mechanical drilling, mostly need in the cold ice section. Okay. And Max, a question for you. Did you uh, want to ask your question and turn on your video? You're more than welcome. Uh, unmute first. Was that Max? No? Okay, I guess I'm... He said just chat, just chat. He said just chat, old computer. Oh, that's what he said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so sorry, no video, okay. Have any specific uh, scientific instrument studies uh, been proposed already? Uh, there is a cold tech uh, call... Um, um, and there are some some of the thing I had in my um, uh, one of the slides. You know, there are instrument calls. So, so one of the big challenge coming up is our instruments. How do you, for example, um, which which you know this community might might be uh, have insight? But one of the big challenges uh, sampling, uh, especially if you are um, <clears throat> so first off in a cryogenic environment at the beginning, and the end you are in a warm ice, high pressure environment. I do. I get something from outside the the cryobot to inside the cryobot for sampling, without uh, basically damaging the sample in the first place. So there are a lot of people asking those type of question. Um, also, how far out in the ice need, do I need to go so that I don't say have a so-called heated sample as an example? Um, um, so there is a combination of instrument looking at. Uh, so we have we had. 
think published kind of a generic list of instruments that uh, would be uh, suitable for this type of uh, explore, scientific exploration. And I know that there are um, studies going on, uh, you know, along those lines. But yeah, it's it's work forward work, absolutely. Okay, and maybe you should also add in there that uh, you know there are uh, presentations. For example, the one that uh, Jean Pierre is showing now, and the video will be available. Um, and uh, you you could well, if there is a, is there any listing of these instruments somewhere publicly available, uh, Jean Pierre? I think so. I think Emily Kloniki had uh, put a paper together that had uh, uh, kind of a description oh. of the the classes of instrument that would be relevant. Okay. One of the big aspect of it is that the need for miniaturization. Right. So, obviously. So I, I guess the issue is, uh, Max, um, if you take that list, then you can see what we've been looking for. So if you're interested in being part of that, you may be, be able to start thinking about getting involved and preparing and uh, all such instruments and maybe miniaturization. Just a thought. So um, maybe you need an... So yeah, that would be it. Okay. So uh, let's see. Marcus, you are up, I hope, still. Uh, it's very early for UK and especially Norway. Um, I'm sure yes. you question. <laughs> Got yeah, so, please. Uh, by the way, Mark, sorry, I don't have a uh, video. Yeah, no, that's not a problem. And Marcos was an intern at JPL last year. Um, amazing intern. Anyway, okay, ask your uh, question, Marcos. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the presentation. It was great. Um, so my question is, can the probe, uh, can the probe reverse in case it bumps its nose into something on its way down that it cannot melt its way through? Ah. The short answer is no. <laughs> Once it goes down, it goes down. Um, that would take quite something for the probe to be able to go back. So, which is really what it really needs to <clears throat> um, uh, to be able to illuminate the, what's in front of it to really understand uh, the uh, what kind of hazard might be there. So, for example, there's a thought that we actually quite a quite a bit of power. Uh, actually, what we had had discussion with. Uh, doing our um, uh, workshop that we had, Knut, back in, uh, uh, sounds like pre, pre, right before the confinement, while everybody ended up sh shutting oh, up last year. Yeah, one of the things we talked about is having a high power um, acoustic uh, device at the surface uh, that would basically illuminate the front of it, you know, right before we, we uh, or even before we, uh, so we understand what's in front of us, um, and we have, you know, we have kilowatt class electrical power on board the probe, and the ability, of course, to store uh, more more uh, power uh, energy if we if we need to. So there is a the requirement is you really have to um, flag all the hazards as far as you uh, as possible ahead of you. So yeah, no 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 backing back, no backing out. You keep going. Okay, let's see. You could stop, uh, you know, or slow down, but you could not back out. Okay, and Ed, I don't think we can answer this, but he, um, I'm going to refer to it anyway. He says, then the death question, how much would the miss this mission cost? <laughs> oh, <clears throat> it's a it's a flagship, uh, it's a it's a flagship mission class. So we're talking, you know. Uh, you know, cost exercise are, are usually not worth the paper they're they're done on. Uh, you know, early on, but it's a it it's um you know um, you have to think about it as a Mars rover. I mean, full size Mars rover type mission. It's a flagship mission. So you know, NASA flagship mission are in the north of two billion dollars range typically. So you know. Nothing less, but you got to realize that uh, you know this is a mission that would return science for seven years at the very least. So, kind of a unique. No, it is no doubt about it. Okay, I see we're just at the hour. Um, would you have time for a question from Boris again, uh, Jean Pierre? Sure. Okay, Boris, uh, please. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to think about the safety and redundancy reasons, would you consider using two or three cryobots instead of just one in case there are failures because it's such a unique mission? Um, you know, I mean, I've had experiences where I usually 
if things are cr critical and they're very difficult, then I, I try to make, uh, I do two or three in case one of them fails. <clears throat> Yeah, so so the idea here is to have a, a technology demonstration, uh, you know, a milestone before you get to the full, you know, nobody's going to, back to the how much it costs, nobody's going to give you this check unless you, you have a pretty high confidence that it's going to work. So um, you have to go through a, a, a campaign where you actually demonstrate things like uh, mobility. Uh, you're, you demonstrate, so we were planning on using both a combination of lab scale uh, test beds as well as deep ice uh, demonstration of uh, that our ability to uh, 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 maneuver and uh, penetrate ice and solve. When you do those test beds, you typically will throw things that are worst case to it and see what you can do with it. So yeah, there's a whole campaign before before we get there. But in terms of the cryobot itself. It's, the cryobot is going to be expensive enough by itself that uh, most likely we wouldn't do two of them <laughs> on oh, the same mission. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems so risky, you know. It'd be nice to have a backup, but anyway. <laughs> no, you're right. Which is one of the big challenge. You have to demonstrate feasibility. That's one of the big. That's one of the tall pole. You have to show that it's it's it's, it's, it's doable. But you know, we're, we we're landing a ton uh, uh, or one ton rover on Mars using a parachute and a sky crane, and then we are gonna hopefully have a helicopter flying in in a few weeks uh, as a technology demonstration. So that's that's how you do it. Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we're um, sort of at the end of questions here. Let's see if I just make sure that I didn't forget anybody. No, no we didn't. Okay, um, then I'm gonna open up Give me a second here. There we go. Mute, unmute all. I'm going to open up all microphones. There we go. It's going to work. Okay. If I, if you didn't manage to unmute yourself, uh, if you can please unmute yourself, and then we're going to give Jean Pierre a little applause. Can you help me with that? <laughs> okay. Unmute yourself, and uh, let's give Jean Pierre a big applause. So let's see. Get, I'm going to give him a second here to unmute. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, I put up a slide here. Uh, yeah, anyways. You may want to unmute now, but that's okay. Before we leave, we're going to have another talk. And this will be Sintaf. There we go. Okay. Let's see. I'm still muted. Uh, I'm still on. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. In April, we're going to have a talk, and that will be by Syntef. It will be uh, this is a co potential collaboration partner with JPL, and Syntef is one of the largest uh, independent research organizations in Europe. Works very closely with NTNU. And they will talk about uh, potential collaboration efforts, Svalbard, and also probably a eels-type robot that will be tested or is tested now in the Trondheim Fjord and will be tested down to 340 meters out at Oskart, a oil and gas installation in the North Sea. And uh, this will actually, it will live down there for an extended period of time and do charging and autonomous operation. It's a quite amazing. Uh, work that's being done there. And there is potential for that work being also come into collaboration with Colin Carpenter's work that we talked about earlier. Um, if you have any questions, send us an email. We'd be more than happy to help you in getting in touch with the right people. And uh, again, if you look at this uh, link here, it's the same link as you had this time. It's the same link next time. And it's going to be in April sometime, but th that uh, next one will be uh, more on the Norwegian time frame uh, because it will be a Norwegian presenter, so we can't really ask them to come up and you know join us at four o'clock in the morning. So with that, uh, thank you everybody, and uh, looking forward to seeing you next time. And thank you again, Jean Pierre. Really appreciate you being part of this, and uh, uh, great work you're doing. Thank you. <laughs>